the lights on, yeah. but. Okay, so yeah, if you, okay, if you want to well, grab that I'm one. Lonnie's going to take over from me. Yeah. It does work. Okay, uh, let's start by just reminding people of process. This is a joint session. Uh, after questions finish at the end of the session, uh, those who want uh, Esteban Lorenzo and Mars will go upstairs, and those who want Stampy uh, and then Alan Knight talking about store will stay down here. So, Norm Green is the research and development director for Gemstone. Yesterday, I overheard someone ask me, asking Norm uh, what he was doing at that moment, and his reply was, I write C, so you don't have to. <laughs> this is the man who writes C, so that we can write small talk, and I think we should show our appreciation to him. Thank you. Check. Thanks, Neil. Um, I'd first like to compliment Lucas for working the term brain fuck into his presentation. It's something I've never been able to do. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a few things about Gemstone 64, and then uh, Monty's going to talk a little bit about uh, Maglev, which is our Ruby project built on top of Gemstone 64 at the end. Um, so I'll first talk about the M&A. Most people have heard that VMware was acquired. I'm sorry, Gemstone was acquired by VMware. Um, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't tweet that. <laughs> That's how rumors start. Um, then I'll go over the announcement again and uh, talk about the roadmap. So we were acquired on May 17th by VMware. Most people know who VMware is. It's a pretty large company. Two billion in revenue, 8,000 employees all over the world and in every city you can imagine. Headquarters is actually right up the street from the old Xerox Park building, which I found interesting when I visited there. It's literally a, across the street. And the good thing about VMware is it's a very technology-driven company right up to the top, which is something that uh, my team and myself have really enjoyed. I mean, pretty much everybody there is or was recently technical. So I'll just go over a few questions that I've been asked a lot kind of since the merger by, by customers. Um, one we get a lot is, well, what's really changed for you guys um, since the merger? And, and the answer is really not a whole lot. Um, it's the same team, same support team. Uh, there's a new reporting structure, which uh, we kind of expected after a merger. Uh, we got better PowerPoint graphics, better snacks in the lunchroom, you know. More, more paperwork, more bureaucracy, more things to fill out. Um, the upside of that is there's more funding uh, to get new computers and things like that. So basically merged into a bigger company. But um, VMware is, is well aware of small talk. They've heard of it, even though it's not what they're doing currently. And um, I have had a lot of people there come up to me and say, oh, I really did that in the 90s, and I really like that. You know, I used, I used to do that before I was moved on to Java or, or whatever. So. There is an awareness, which is always good. Um, the other one I get a lot is, is, well, what about this maglev thing? Are you guys, you know, dumping small talk to go to Ruby? And you know, th that's a it's a fair question, but the answer in a word is no. Um, Monty will talk about that more later. But maglev is really built on top of the Gemstone small talk engine, so it's a complementary product. Um, the code base is largely shared. And um, Monty will build on that later on, but we're not planning to get out of the small talk business anytime. And that gets into what about the future of our small talk business, and uh, we continue to be very comfortable with that. 
we have um, very large enterprises all over the world running Gemstone S to run their businesses. I won't go into this too much, but I think there's been presentations at other small talk conferences. Uh, but 20% of the world shipping container business goes through a Gemstone small talk system across three companies. Uh, Capital at JP Morgan, I know that's been talked about here before, that's still going strong and, and there's lots of others. So it, it's really not something that can just dry up and blow away. Um, continues to be strong and, you know, we're used to hearing rumors that Gemstone or Smalltalk is not going to be around and, you know, I think the latest one I heard is, well, VMware is going to get rid of it in four years and so on. And, you know, this is nothing new to us. We hear this every year, you know we're not going to be around for this reason or that. And after 24 years of doing this, we're frankly used to it. You know, the, our, our demise has been exaggerated lots of times before and it will be again. Okay, just to recap the announcement uh, Monty made on Monday. Um, this is the increased um, availability of the uh, free commercial license for Gemstone Web Edition. Uh, two CPUs instead of one, 16 gig repository now instead of four, two gig of shared page cache instead of one, community support, although that may change. Um, we may offer a support uh, for fee in the future, but uh, no announcement on that yet, and that is free. Okay, now I'll talk about our, our new major version that we're working on right now, Gemstone 64 version 3. Um, I'll just go through some of the technical highlights here. One thing we're doing is native code. What that means is the first time your method is invoked, it gets compiled over to the native um, byte codes or uh, instructions for that, for, uh, op for that processor that you're running on. Um, kind of like a JIT compiler. We used to have that back in the 32-bit days. We haven't, haven't had that for a while. And that gets you anywhere between one and a half and two X faster small talk execution in doing that. Um, we also did something, and this was actually driven by the Maglev guys. Um, if anyone's ever run Gemstone on a laptop and decided to do something like VPN in someplace or go to Starbucks and get on the Wi-Fi so your IP address changes. Uh, Gemstone does not like that currently. Um, it tends to lock up. It doesn't think that its um, host name or IP address should change. This goes back to the early days of when Gemstone was built years ago where you know, there were no laptops and a machine had an IP address that never changed. Um, we've addressed that in 3.0 where Gemstone now uh, doesn't care if you change its um, IP address or name or anything. So you can go into Starbucks, VPN in, get off, go to a different Wi-Fi, it's all fine. It doesn't lock up. Um, this is something for our larger customers. We have multi-threaded a lot of the processes that scan the entire repository. The big one is global garbage collection. Um, the single threaded model garbage collecting a repository of one and a half to two billion objects can take uh, days or weeks to complete. We have got that to an order of magnitude or better faster uh, by multi-threading that in version three. Um, spent a lot of time on that. It's something that's been asked for for a long time. So this really um, scales up the garbage collection and repository scan algorithms to match the scalability of the product. Also for listing instances, um, people that haven't used server small talk are used to just saying, well, show me all my instances of X and it comes right back. Well, in Gemstone, if you've got a couple billion objects to look at, it takes more time. Um, but we've multi-threaded that now, so it goes a lot faster than it did. And this third thing is something called GS object inventory, and we get this request a lot from customers. I want a report where um, I sort my objects by class and instance count or I sort my objects by class and number of bytes they take. And we were getting that so much, so we basically just wrote a class that did that in primitives for speed. So you can um, run a report now and, and get a, it looks like a basically a big dictionary of all your classes in Gemstone to find out where's my space going because people will say, well, the database is, you know, eight gigabytes. I can't believe my objects take that much space. Why? 
Well, this answers that question. Uh, we have something called FFI, or Foreign Function Interface in 3.0, and this allows you to load third-party shared libraries without writing any C code, which was previously not possible in Gemstone. Uh, to do this previously, you had to write a, a user action, which is a, a fancy name for user-defined C primitive in Gemstone, and then load the library there, uh, which lots of people have done, but this keeps it uh, entirely in Smalltalk. Also in 3.0, we're supporting external authentication support. Um, some customers don't like that they have to have a separate Gemstone database login in order to authenticate when they start. They want to uh, just log in once or, or use their corporate LDAP server or whatever authentication scheme they have for their enterprise. And in 3.0, you can do that. You can set up a user profile in Gemstone to use external authentication uh, the two we support right now are just uh, standard Unix password authentication, so it'll authenticate off your Unix password or talking to an LDAP server. And this list can grow um, as demand requires pass 3 to other authentication means. We've added these two right now. So if you enable this uh, for a user profile, there is no password for that guy stored in Gemstone any longer. It's basically outsourced the authentication to the external server. Um, something else we did in 3.0, this is fairly low level, but we, we got tired of dealing with all the uh, asynchronous I.O. bugs from the various operating system vendors that um, hit us in various ways. We basically threw it out and wrote our own using uh, native C threads. And this actually gets us a little bit faster commit throughput as well. We've also improved our support for ANSI. Um, James Foster has spent quite a bit of time working on that. Uh, one of the major things in that area is native support for ANSI exceptions. In the previous versions, the ANSI exception support was written on top of gemstone exceptions as a kind of an abstraction. And that worked OK most of the time, but there were some bugs in it, and it wasn't particularly fast. Uh, we're now supporting ANSI exceptions right down to the bytecode level. So the support is better, and it works much better in 3.0. We've also uh, speeded up some of the, the uh, number classes in 3.0 and have new implementations of them, specifically scale decimal and these large negative uh, integers. And scale decimal has been renamed a fixed point in 64, so there's some people that really like the way our scale decimal works. There's some people that really don't like it. And why can't you guys do it like uh, small talk die like X does it? And uh, we now will have the choice. I think there's two major ways of doing it, and we're now doing both. Um, we've also done some low-level stuff in the gem to stone communication. This is where a, a VM you know, needs something from the stone process uh, to commit or um, get some uh, new pages or object IDs or what have you. Um, this used to all be serialized using a, a spin lock, and we've redesigned that using um, atomic instructions so that there is no serialization now in order to get in the queue uh, for service from Stone. And this gets, a, a, on a busy system, 30% improvement in response time on getting service from the Stone. So most people won't notice this, but we do have some customers that run at the absolute red line of their system in, in putting transactions through Gemstone. And for customers like that, it will be a nice improvement. Uh, we introduced something called session priority, again, for very busy systems where if there are a dozen sessions that want service from the stone, pr previously there was really no way to prioritize which one we get first. It was done first come, first serve. Now, uh, with session priority, there are customers that say, well, this VM is a really important VM. It, it needs to always run first. This other one is really not important. It can really go to the back of the line. There's now a way to set that in uh, Gemstone 64 so that you're if two sessions are in the, the Stone's run queue at the same time, the highest priority one will get served first. The commit order. Um, well, the commit is kind of a special case because the session that wants, has the commit token or is about to get the commit token is always at the front of the line no matter what his priority is. 
Um, but the commit order is, is, is a randomized anyway. You really, unless you ta do something to manage it yourself, you really can't guarantee session A will commit before session B. But yeah, it can affect that, but point being that you didn't have a whole lot of control over that to start with, so you didn't really lose much. Good question. Our server platforms haven't changed. We're on uh, Solaris, both uh, x86 and Spark, HP Itanium, AIX, PowerPC, uh, Apple Mac. Not everybody knows that, but if you have 64-bit uh, Intel Mac, you can run Gemstone on it. And Linux on x86-64, not PowerPC. So that's a summary of what's coming in 3.0. Um, Beyond 3.0, looking forward, uh, some things we're thinking about. Um, there's been requests for nested transactions, and that's something we're looking into uh, for 4.0. It's too early to, to commit to that yet, but it's high on the list. Uh, something our corporate customers ask a lot for is failover hot standby support. Currently with Gemstone, you can do kind of a warm standby solution where you can have uh, a disaster recovery database 10 or 15 minutes out of sync with the main one. So you can keep up reasonably, but not right up to the commit level. And the hot standby takes that to the next level where every commit is replayed immediately to a standby database. Oracle calls this database clustering in their technology. Um, so that's something a lot of corporate customers have asked for over the years, and, and we think we're going to get that done for uh, 4.0. Um, other things on the radar that we're looking at, ODBC support keeps coming up over and over again. We used to have that a long time ago, uh, back in the 90s. It was called Gem Access, and for various lawyer reasons I won't go into, we don't support that anymore with that code base. But that doesn't mean we couldn't go and rewrite it um, ourselves and, and support ODBC once again. So we're thinking about doing that. IPv6 is constantly there. Uh, we kind of know that day is coming, but we haven't had any requests for it specifically yet where a customer has said, I've got to have IPv6 by X date in order to support my corporate network. Um, secure sockets would be something nice to have. We actually have OpenSSL uh, linked into the product in 3.0. We just don't have a Smalltalk interface for it built yet. And the reason that's in there is um, the LDAP code needed to be able to do SSL. So it's really just a matter of building a, a GS secure socket class and, and being able to talk to the, the, the SSL, open SSL library. Um, automatic load balancing is something that also comes up from our bigger customers again. If I've got, say, 10 servers all running uh, Gemstone VMs on them and I want to add a new VM, um, which server should I run it on? It'd be nice if Gemstone had a load balancer that picked the least loaded machine and spun the VM up on that machine automatically. Right now, um, customers kind of have to roll their own in order to do that. Um, we get requests for single sign-on support um, reasonably often as well. And the idea there would be once you log into uh, Windows in the corporate world and bring up your Smalltalk image, you wouldn't need to do another login to get into Gemstone. Um, that would be a real nice to have. That's a hard, relatively difficult thing for us to do because it touches a lot of moving pieces. You have to deal with the Smalltalk image on Windows. You have to deal with the Gemstone VM on, on Unix. You have to deal with Windows security, talking Unix security, and make sure the person is authorized and authenticated to, to do that. So it's a nice to have, but it's not an easy one. And also something that keeps coming up is better managing and monitoring support. Um, we were looking at SNMP at one time, and the simple, uh, the S in SNMP should not stand for simple, because if you ever read anything about SNMP, it is not simple. <laughs> um, lately, our customers have been saying, we'd really prefer you do JMX anyway, um, and that looks actually a bit better, although not simple, but it looks easier to implement. So we're kind of looking at that now, too. Uh, timelines. We've committed to the business that we will ship 3.0 at the end of, at the latest at the end of second quarter next year. And then we'll probably do a dot release at the end of next year to fix any issues that come up with the main release. And then 4.0, that puts it out to probably sometime middle of 012 with 4.1 at the end of 012 or early 13. So 
So you can see we're planning releases out as far as two or three years out. Um, that's it for my bit. I'll turn it over to Monty Williams now, who uh, is running our maglev project on top of Gemstone S to talk a little bit about that. I just need a web browser. Just one question um, about your supported platforms. Why is yeah. Windows not on there? <coughs> Windows? Yep. Um, I was wondering if somebody would ask that. Oh. <laughs> run, a VM, yeah. run a VMware virtual machine. The, the answer is it, 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 it's a very high cost for us to support Windows version because the majority of the source code is different because Windows just does everything different. All the other platforms are Unix based and while there are some differences, they're not that major. It's, it's, it's relatively easy to take care of that. Programming Windows, particularly 64-bit Windows, is, is basically a separate code base and a separate product. So take a million lines of code and double it. And it really just doesn't uh, uh, make business sense for us to do that. We don't have a lot of customers that want to run on Windows. There's one or two, but if you do the cost benefit, it's never really just played out. But that's the server. There's still client. Yeah. Well, that's to be clear. Yeah, you can run your, you know, a client small talk image on Windows and talk to Gemstone. People do that every day. And and we the Gem Builder for small talk is supported on Windows. It's the database server that I was talking about. Thirty-two bit. Yeah, still has the old Windows version on it. Um, we haven't touched the code in a long time, and uh, I guess it still works. We, we test it, but we're, we don't put much work on that. I can do this in five minutes. So we talked about the free is beer is in beer version of uh, glass, and I wanted to show people where you get the goodies. So uh, if you go to seaside.gemstone.com, hmm? oh, cool, this mouse works, great. If you go to seaside.gemstone.com, uh, I first wanted to explain real quickly, people didn't understand what the difference was between glass and normal gemstone S. And uh, there was some confusion. There might be like a GBS for Faro for those of you who use GBS with VisualWorks. No, the glass stuff is really intended to run web apps, not huge client server apps. So if you look at this license, it talks about where it, it you know, it doesn't run on Solaris, it doesn't support VisualWorks or VisualAge, and it doesn't support clustered gems. So that's when, when you get glass for free, you don't get the whole enterprise gemstone S. But hopefully you're not trying to run it with uh, we have customers running on, uh, it used to be 128 gig shared page cache, now they're running on a 256 gig shared page cache. They've got uh, 4,000 remote uh, virtual machines connected at the same time. You don't need that to run a web server. So get Glass if you want to run a web edition. Uh, and what you do is you go to seaside.gemstone.com, et cetera. I haven't had time to update the website yet, so there aren't links to this, but this is where you get the key files. Uh, there's two, there's one for Linux and one for Mac. Uh, and you can see it's a two CPU key file. Uh, the repository size limit actually says unlimited. And if you go over 16 gigs, it will continue to run because we didn't want to put a hard limit for people where if they hit 16 gigs, all of a sudden you can't log in anymore. That would be rather evil. So it actually supports probably about a gazillion pages. However, the 16 gigs is a practical limit because with a two gig shared page cache, what you wind in up with is your object table you know, needs to fit in memory in order for you to have any performance. So uh, when you get this, it really is pretty much a, a 16 gig repository. Uh, but the key files, seaside.gemstone.com slash et cetera, if you're running glass, want a bigger key file, there it is. Uh, you rename them to uh, gemstone.key, put them where normal key files are. Uh, then I wanted to talk about uh, maglev, which is, uh, as Norm mentioned, built on 
two things about it. One, it's built on top of Gemstone S3.0. So if you're interested in getting your hands on Gemstone S3.0, just go grab Maglev. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, pre-alpha. It's, it's not even that. I mean, we just implemented partial continuations last week, and Dale hasn't had any time to even test them. So I, I can't say that it'll run anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just do that. If you have problems, uh, I'll be on vacation next week. So, <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, for those of you who do want to look at it, I mean, it, it does run. Uh, I'm not saying that it runs Seaside, but the gemstone part of it runs. And that's, uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, I think, uh, pretty much it. But the, the maglev, by running on top of gemstone S3.0, and the reason I brought it up on, Git, on GitHub, it is a free as in speech as well. I mean, it's comp Maglev, yes. Maglev is Ruby code and Smalltalk code that runs on top of Gemstone S3.0, and it is an MIT licensed open source component. Now, you can't run it without a Gemstone 3.0, which is proprietary, but if you want to get involved in Maglev, if you have any interest in Ruby, if you have any interest in trying to get Seaside and Ruby uh, you know, Seaside and Rails working together. Uh, you know, we're we're, uh, we're we're trying to figure out the best way to enable collaboration with you know universities and other people. But you can go out on GitHub, get it, look at the code, uh, you know, read the README, get started, and you don't have to use it to run Ruby. Yes. How much interest is there for gem for Maglev in the Ruby community? Uh, Quite a bit. It's like, uh, it's like the, s the the Ruby community is like the small talk community on steroids. They're both, pa you know, we both are very passionate groups. We're both very passionate about our language, uh, and we're starting to see some crossover where people are giving talks on. Wow, I started running Maglev, and I've discovered Seaside, and and or you know, I used to run Rails. I'm, I've discovered Seaside. So there's a lot of respect for small talk in the Ruby community, and uh, I will tell you that when you go to a conference there, the, you know, I go to some small conf went to a small conference last two weeks ago in Japan, which was like 800 people, and then the Rails conferences will be 3,000 people, and if you know, they are absolutely as convinced that Ruby is the end all be all as small talkers are that that small talk is, but they have a lot of respect for small talk. Kent Beck talks there, and they're always like, "Wow, this is really cool." So we have a question a in the back. Question in the back. Um, can you clarify the CPU limitation on those versions of um, glass per se? Because in today's world, you have sockets and you have cores, and different um, licensing schemes use different. Uh, uh, it's different so bases. so. There's a uh, uh, well. It's uh, yeah. It's actually I th it, it's actually cores because we use we you know we use uh, software. Uh, Magic stuff to uh, you know to do the limitation. So it'll run on more. Systems. Oh yeah, it'll run. On, I mean, you can run it on a four CPU machine. It only it just will only use two cores on right. your four on your four CPU right. box. Right. Yeah, CPUs. So so Dale, you know, for example, runs on his uh, on his two CPU laptop. He can get uh, like 500 restful URL, you know, hits a minute. A, a se sorry, a second on his. You know, so I mean. It's whatever the operating system considers a, uh, a CPU. Yeah, right. It's whatever the operating system. So if you have hyperthreading turned on, for instance, then that would be considered a CPU. And if you turn it off, then you'll have half the yeah. number of CPUs, but they'll be faster. Don't run on more than two CPUs. So you could actually, you know, have a VM that emulates two sockets, but says, you know, there's four cores per well, socket. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Try it out and let me know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If, uh, at this point, I think we'll thank uh, Norm and Monty for that. We have now two. Con yeah. Uh, James, James, I wanted to make one comment. Dale wants to. Yeah conclude. Is it? Yeah. Okay. I, I was being facetious about getting a hold of money for uh, the 3L stuff, so I just wanted to clarify that. 
Um, there is a, the, the configuration for Seaside 3.0 has a, has a Gemstone 3.0 uh, um, component to it, so you can just go ahead and load. So, but it hasn't been very hev heavily tested, all right? But it'll run and load and uh, should be very equivalent to what you get with the, the, two, the 2.x. So. so I'd like those who are interested in the Mars and OOSCM, at least uh, Mars will be starting in uh, moments upstairs. So uh, this is not a coffee break time. This is uh, head upstairs for the next presentation. And uh, we'll have Stampy and then Store taking place here downstairs. So the next uh, sessions will be starting in moments.